Transfigure us, O Lord. Transfigure us, O Lord. Break the chains. The doctor decided to tell the patient the truth about the result of the blood test. So he said, Sir, at this point, I would like to sincerely tell you that the results of your tests are out. And from all we have gathered, your prognosis does not look good at all. From every indication, you have just a few more days to live. And so since your time is short, is there anyone you would like to talk to before you die? Then the patient looked at the doctor and said, yes, another doctor. <laughs> the event in today's gospel passage is the transfiguration of the Lord. It is the fourth of the five mysteries of light of the Holy Rosary. Right from the time of the early Christians, Christians have tried to make meaning out of this mystery of the transfiguration of the Lord. In one of his homilies on the transfiguration of the Lord, St. John Chrysostom gives reasons why Moses and Elijah appeared on the mountain at the time of the transfiguration. He explains that Moses and Elijah appeared to vindicate Jesus, to clear Jesus of the allegations of blasphemy and transgression of the law. For Jesus was accused of blasphemy. That is, he was accused of being disrespectful to God, of speaking against God. He was also accused of breaking the law. Moses was the chief lawgiver in the Old Testament. Moses appeared. Elijah was very zealous for the Lord. Elijah defended the glory of the Lord. He went to the extent of killing 450 prophets of Baal, 450 fake prophets, because they were disrespectful to the Lord. Now, Jesus was accused of being disrespectful. Jesus was accused of breaking the law. Yet, Moses and Elijah appeared and they did not condemn Jesus. So that was to show that Jesus was on the right path. They appeared to vindicate Jesus, that he was not guilty of blasphemy and he was not guilty of breaking the law. And so at this point, for you, my dearly beloved in Christ, I have no idea who is here and is suffering from false allegation. Maybe for the good things you are doing, people are giving you bad names. They are persecuting you. The more you do something that is good, the more they give you bad names. I have good news for you. You are not alone. Jesus has been there. And so, I encourage you to take it up to Jesus and share with him what you are going through. And the Father who vindicated him by sending Moses and Elijah is also there for you. Another reason why Moses and Elijah appeared was to show that Jesus has power over death and life. You remember, Moses died before the Israelites got to the promised land. And so Moses was there to represent death. Elijah did not die. At the end of his time here on earth, he was taken up to heaven alive. And so Elijah represents life. 
with the presence of Moses and Elijah, that Jesus summoned both of them was to show that Jesus has power over life and death. Another way of understanding what is happening here is to go back to what we explained during the homily for last Sunday, for those who were at any of my masses. I did share that just like us, Jesus as a human being grew up struggling, facing this question of self-identity. Who am I? What is my identity? And having known my identity, what does it imply? What is the meaning? What is expected of me based on my identity? Regarding his identity, he got the answer at his baptism, where a voice spoke from heaven, identifying him as the beloved son of God. So, one has been taken care of, his identity, he's the beloved son of God. But the next question, what does that mean? What is he to do with that identity? And so he went to the desert to pray and to fast 40 days and 40 nights. That was where the devil came to tempt him, to confuse him about the implication of his identity. Halfway into his public ministry, Jesus turned to his apostles to check with them to know if they knew his identity. And so he asked them, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And then the apostles began to tell him, some are saying that you are John the Baptist. Others are saying that you are Elijah. Some others are saying it's either you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, really? So people don't really know who I am. And so he decided to take with him Peter, James, and John up to the mountain. And there he summoned Moses and Elijah. It's a way of saying, can you see the difference? Can you see who I am? And then can you see Elijah is different and Moses is different? It is just like me walking across to Our Lady of Mount Carmel School and then maybe some of the students coming up to me to say, good morning, Sister Eva. <laughs> and I'm going to say, really? Me, Sister Eva? Then I'll walk to the office of the principal and I'll call Sister Eva out and then I'll tell the students, can you see that she has a veil and I do not have a veil? So I am not Sister Eva. So that is what Jesus did. He took them up to say, spot the difference. I am not Moses. I am not Elijah. I'm not one of the prophets. I'm someone different. And so, after asking them the question of who do people say, then he went to the next level. What about you? Who do you say I am? In response to that, Peter was the one who spoke. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus gave him thumbs up. Good job. But that was not the end. Now you have known my identity. What about the implication of my identity? Do you know? Now let me educate you on that. Because I am the Messiah, I am on my way to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die on the cross. And Peter got mad. And Peter rebuked Jesus and challenged Jesus. Who is giving you those crazy ideas? You are the Messiah. You can't die. Stop it. And then Jesus got it that Peter did not know the implication at all. And that again became a reason to take Peter and two other disciples up to the mountain. And there, Moses and Elijah appeared. Moses stood for the law. Elijah stood for the prophets. You know, we have the law and the prophets in the Old Testament. So, Moses and Elijah stood for the Old Testament and Jesus for the New Testament. It was a way of telling Peter, can you see how the journey is moving? Can you see that it began with the Old Testament? Moses and Elijah. And I am here now as a New Testament, a fulfillment of what Moses and Elijah have already said. So get it right now. 
Do not derail me. I am on the right track. And next to that came a voice from heaven, the voice declaring Jesus again, the Son, the beloved Son of God. The Gospel says, the voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Just like it happened during the baptism of Jesus. But there is an addition here. Next, the voice said, listen to him. That was primarily addressed to Peter, because Peter was the one arguing with Jesus. Peter was the one trying to teach Jesus how to be the Messiah. But the voice from heaven is saying, Peter, keep quiet and make use of your two ears. Listen to him. He is on the right track. Do not be a discouragement to him. The transfiguration happened as an opportunity of encouragement for Jesus, an opportunity of encouragement also for the apostles, because Jesus was already getting closer and closer to the cross. And getting closer to the cross, it was needed for Jesus to be encouraged by his Father to say, I know it is hard, I know it is difficult, but I'm with you. Carry on, you are on the right track. The apostles also needed to be encouraged. Two chapters after today's passage, Peter is going to ask Jesus, we have left everything, and now we are following you. How much is going to be our salary? How much are you going to pay us for all that we have left behind? And Jesus is going to say to Peter, no one who leaves father, mother, brother, sister, children, to follow me that will go empty-handed. Such a person will be rewarded in hundredfold. Whoever leaves all this behind for my sake and the sake of the gospel will be rewarded in hundredfold. The transfiguration today is preparing Peter for that answer two chapters ahead. For when Peter went up and he saw just a glimpse of heaven, just a preview of the movie, Peter said, wow, too good to be true. I'm not living here. I'm going to remain here. Guess what? I'm now going to build three tents. One for you, Jesus. One for Moses. One for Elijah. I don't even care about myself. I just want to remain here. He forgot about all that he left behind. But Jesus said, this is just a preview. Wait until you get the real movie. And in order to get the real thing, the real reward, we have to go down the mountain and then go through the cross. It is after the cross that we can get the true reward, the full portion of the reward that we are awaiting. As we make our journey through life, God continues to reveal to us the need to let go of things that are less noble in order to get things that are nobler, things that are less important in order to get things that are more important. Abraham, in the first reading, was encouraged, was called by God to leave behind his country, to leave behind every other thing and go ahead for the greater blessings awaiting him. The apostles also, when they were called, Jesus told them to leave behind whatever they were doing that there was a greater future awaiting them. For us, in the season of Lent, we are also encouraged to give up something. Give up your pride. Give up your ego. Give up gossiping. Give up selfishness. Give up everything that is bad. And God will replace them with something more wonderful for you. Today's transfiguration, as we said earlier, was meant to encourage Jesus. The transfiguration was meant to encourage the apostles. And so, my dearly beloved in Christ, for you at this moment, I have no idea the discouragement you are facing. Maybe a voice is speaking to you. Maybe someone dear to you is telling you that you are too old to achieve that thing you are planning to achieve, that you are too young to attain that goal that you have been striving for. 
Maybe your teacher is telling you that you are too dumb to learn. Maybe someone is telling you that you have committed so many sins that you don't need to waste your time coming to God, that God will not listen to you. I have good news for you. Do not give up. It is never over until it is over. Do not let anybody to conclude your story for you while you are still alive. God is still working on you. And you know what they say? When discouragement is greatest, know that your success is closest to you. And above all, the Lord is your strength.